Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the public newsroom. It's so lovely to see uh, just the little section of our public agenda start to get populated with all of your thoughts and ideas about coming today. Um, so I just want to uh, go ahead and kick us off with a little uh, introduction to the people that hosted that are organizing this workshop uh, and, and the topic. Um, so I'll kick things off by just introducing myself. Um, my name is Ellie Mejia and I organize these gatherings for City Bureau. Uh, City Bureau is a nonprofit news organization serving the south and west sides of Chicago. And tonight we are at the Public Newsroom, a free monthly workshop series where we discuss and deconstruct local issues. And sometimes we also explore a framework or tool that can help us build civic power. Uh, so today we're talking about communities of practice, a type of group learning framework where people learn by doing and then coming together to reflect, dialogue, and share resources and skills. Uh, and the reason that City Bureau is interested in this topic is that we find that the spirit behind communities of practice really resonates with the values that we aim to embody as an organization, right? So they resist hierarchy, they honor that everyone has something to contribute and to take away. Um, they show us the value of and power of relationship building. Uh, so we're sitting with this concept in our work and we're thinking about how it might show up and whether it's something we want to cultivate more intentionally. Um, so this is a newsroom where we're really asking you to sit with, with us in something that we're not experts at. Uh, and that is why we are really lucky to be joined by Lila Mills and Lisa Jean Sylvia, who are here to speak more on the community of practice that Neighbor Up has been cultivating uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, Neighbor Up is a civic organization that's working to make a more just Cleveland in a variety of ways. I will wait for them to, uh, once we kick it off to them, to explain it because they can do it way better than I can. Um, but I will say they're extremely skilled at community building and they are also the home of the Cleveland Documenters program. Uh, we also have India Daniels, the field coordinator of the original Chicago documenters who can speak more to the ways that members of the Docs Network are forming connections and learning from one another. Uh, and for those of you who are like, Ellie, what are you talking about? Documenters is a program that trains and pays people to keep an eye on local government. Uh, the original pilot was here in Chicago, uh, and now there are programs in Detroit, Fresno, and Cleveland. Uh, and I also want to shout out that I see a bunch of documenters in attendance here, so really looking forward to hearing from y'all as we kind of dive into tonight's session. Um, before we do that, just really quick, want to kind of give us a, an orientation around Zoom, because I know some of us are like total experts at it by now, and some of us are a little bit newer to the platform. So uh, just as a heads up, we are recording our session today. Um, it's going to be rebroadcast on CAN TV and uploaded to YouTube. So if you don't want to be a part of that, you can just go ahead and turn your video off with the little uh, camera icon on the bottom of your screen. Uh, we're also streaming live on Facebook. If we are not currently, we will be very soon. Um, so again, if you don't want to be recorded, you can go ahead and turn off your video. Uh, if you need closed captions, if you want to see text appear uh, live as people are saying it, you can go ahead and hit the CC button on the bottom of your screen. Or if you're watching us on Facebook Live, hello, you can also click the gear icon uh, on that video and turn them on. Um, and lastly, just we ask that you keep yourself muted so that we can avoid audio feedback. Y'all are doing such a good job of that already. And if you have any issues on Zoom, you can just drop it in the chat and we will uh, get someone to help you out with that. So uh, unless anyone has any questions on that, I will go ahead and pass it off to India for a quick one-on-one -on, -one on communities of practice. Hi, thank you, Ellie. Um, so it is not working for me to share my screen right now. Um, we'll see if that um, can get fixed in a second, but I'm gonna give a brief introduction anyways um, that you don't really need a slide for. All it said was communities of practice. Um, so as Ellie said, 
I'm India Daniels and I help coordinate City Bureau's Chicago Documenters program. I'm gonna kick us off by sharing a bit of what I've been reading and thinking about communities of practice in relation to documenters. And before we get into it, I'd like you to think of a group or community that you're a part of. I see um, Scott has shared a great example in the chat or one that you wish you had. Uh, if you're comfortable, you can also share in the chat, uh, but also think about what a community of practice has in common and what that community does. Um, so now I will share my screen. Um, great. Thank you. I so first, what is a community of practice? This term uh, refers to the interactions and relationships among a group of people who share interests, experience, and knowledge over time. The other key to understanding what a community of practice is, is that it's a way to think about learning. Communities of practice are everywhere, but the term itself is part of the social theory of learning, um, first used by these scholars in the 1990s Jean Lave and Etienne Wenger in a book called Situated Learning. That book emphasizes the importance of learning as ongoing and hands-on practice, as opposed to the narrow view of something that happens while you're just sitting in a classroom listening to a teacher lecture. And it's interesting because as I've been reading more about this concept, I've heard that a lot of teachers talk about this in relation to their own work of being teachers and learning from other teachers. So it is this kind of meta concept. Um, some other examples of communities of practice are apprenticeships, 12-step uh, programs like Alcoholics Anonymous and scouting. In each of these contexts, there are significant relationships between a mentor figure and a learner. Uh, and there are also regular opportunities to practice and discuss. So it's not always one person being the teacher and the other being the learner. There's kind of a synergy. Um, put this way, a quote from our friend Etienne, uh, we all have our own theories and ways of understanding the world and our communities of practice are places where we develop, negotiate, and share them. So next I have this drawing that you may recognize it appears on our documenters.org homepage. And I like this drawing because I think it illustrates some of what we'll be talking about in relation to communities of practice. So through the documenters program, we train and pay Chicagoans to take notes on or live tweet local government public meetings. While we go over the basics in an orientation training, most of the learning happens while documenters are on assignment and through the feedback and edits that we give them on what they've written. Beyond a part-time writing gig, we're also interested in how the program creates space for participants to learn and collaborate. So when Lila, who you'll hear from in a moment, her org Neighborhood Connection started working with us to start a documenters program in Cleveland, we were intrigued by how they did engagement and employed this concept of community of practice. And that's what led me to start reading up on the concept. Now, City Bureau is also a journalism org and the traditional mode of journalism draws a pretty clear line between the role of the reporter to research and inform and the role of the consumer to absorb the information. It's not unlike that of an instructor and a student. The concept of community of practice, however, encourages us to move beyond those rigid categories of teacher and learner, learning that's something that happens at like set periods of time and instead to consider all the ways that we learn from each other, from practice and from innovation together. So we've started um, implementing the concept of communities of practice into our web chats program, which we started hosting soon after the COVID-19 lockdown started in March of 2020. 
The concept was pretty simple. We wanted to encourage connection and learning among documenters, even though we were all stuck at home. And in the past five months or so, we've honed in a little more on who this is for. So we make it for documenters, our civic reporting programs alumni, and other more engaged members of the City Bureau Network. So maybe this is your first public newsroom, or maybe you're a regular public newsroom attendee. There's a bit of a difference in engagement. Uh, and we think about how this can serve as a professional development experience, how we can give balanced time to both what the host has to share of their knowledge and what attendees bring to the table in the way of experience, insight, and perspective. So you can see some recent topics of web chats here. And these are all kind of related to things that people think about or wonder about through their documentaries assignments. Um, and we'll be sharing some resources for further reading on communities of practice, but I wanted to share a few key elements. Consistency, regular opportunities to learn and connect, accommodation of different levels of engagement. So whether that's a very involved person or a person who kind of comes by once a month or so. Evolution to meet the interests and needs of members. Storytelling, so discussion of the value and meaning of those shared experiences. And intentional integration of newcomers to the benefit of the whole. So as a newcomer, you're not just kind of lowest rung of the ladder. You, your learning benefits those who have been there for much longer. And a community of practice isn't inherently a positive generative space. I know I'm making it sound really great, but you might recognize these um, elements in many a toxic workplace or a corrupt political administration. Uh, but I think it's helpful if you think intentionally about these elements and view your group as a community that hones their craft together that does lay a foundation for a positive intentionality and accountability. So our goals for tonight, um, rather than present this area of thought that we, these thoughts that we've been having and things we've been working on as uh, something that's completely finished and wrapped up with a bow, we wanted to share a work in progress. And we're excited to learn with you from Lila and LJ, who have been fostering a community of practice for several years now. And to think with you both about what a community of practice looks like for City Bureau as a community org, what communities of practice do and could exist around us and how they might all interact. So now I'm done sharing my screen and I'm going to hand it off to LJ. Thanks, India. You gave me a little, a nice little um, pivot into what we were going to say. So while all spaces are not positive and generative, at Neighbor Up, we really love to do our best to create a positive and generative space, um, whether we're at community of practice or not. And so what we're going to do is take a few moments, maybe about five or six minutes, to do a practice um, that we call new and good. And so this is a space for you. I invite you to take yourself off of mute um, and um, participate as if we were in a circle together. And the way that you participate is by simply saying your name and your community and then sharing briefly one thing that's new or good for you. So um, for example, I could go first and it could be a big thing or a small thing, right? So I could go first and I could say, I'm LJ and I'm in um, Bratnall, which is right outside of Cleveland. And my new and good today is that I made a kick-ass soup and it's so amazing and I'm really excited for dinner after this. So that's my new and good. Lila is gonna give us another example and then we'll open it up and you can put it in the chat, but it is more fun to be really honest if you put your voice in the circle a little bit. Lila. You can you can just popcorn in. Yeah, you um, can so my, in. If it makes it easier for you to pop in, you can like raise your electronic hand, but um, you can also just pop in. Lila, why don't you give us another example? So my name's Lila. I'm also in Cleveland. I'm in a community called Beachwood. Um, and my new and good is that I was asked to do an egg hunt for my niece who is three and my son who's seven and my cousin's son who's two. So I'm going to do an Easter egg hunt on Saturday. Yay. I love it. 
and anyone else can pop right in or you can raise your hand if that makes it easier to pop in. Um, Mike Strode, uh, Southeast Chicago, uh, South Deering, Jeffrey Manor. Uh, uh, my new and good is that I had a friend who ordered me lunch while I was away from the house and I found they arrived on and it was on my door and you know I haven't eaten all day so um, I'm eating lunch for dinner. <laughs> what a good friend. That's awesome. Thanks, Mike. Anyone else? Yeah. Hi, my name is Dahlia Glory and I'm Morgan Park neighborhood. And my new good is I've been invited also. I'm not doing the Easter egg, but I've been invited to an Easter egg hunt in the Roseland community. So I'm going to also donate from my organization to see these kids do Easter eggs. Yeah, fantastic. I love it. Yeah. Thanks, Dahlia. Um, I'm Alex. I'm from Chicago um, in the Humboldt Park area. Uh, and my new and good today is I had an appointment with my doctor and got prescribed testosterone to start hormone therapy. Yay! <laughs> awesome. Congratulations. Woo! I love that we can share big things too. Fantastic. Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Claudia, and I'm from the city of Berwyn. And my good and new thing today is that I stumbled on a place called Jamba Juice. If anybody ever heard of it, my first time. And Oh, yeah. I love um, Jamba Juice. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for coming, Claudia. Mike, I see you've been popping your head in. Come on. I got gotcha. you. Come on in. <laughs> Go uh, <ahead. laughs> hi. Thanks. Um, uh, Mike Tish. I live in Uptown uh, over here in Chicago. Um, I did spring cleaning yesterday, found like $40 of gift cards to Starbucks and Visa stuff that I just like slipped by the wayside. So yeah, probably going to be a pretty big weekend for me. Um, so pretty exciting. I love it. Mike's going to be cleaning up more often. And we have someone in the chat, Susan from the South side. Um, Susan's new and good is that they enjoyed the sun, sun rays in their eyes today. Well, you are not in Cleveland, my friend. <laughs> I love it. Anyone else? We have room for a couple more. Sure. My name's Scott, and uh, I'm in Evanston, which is just north of Chicago. And uh, I guess my new and good is that I've, I've got both the COVID vaccines now. And so do my three 20 something kids, and they didn't do anything immoral or, you know, they didn't jump the line. They they were able to do volunteer work. My two sons actually are in Louisville or went to Louisville where if you work for 40 hours, you know, in connection with the vaccine and all that, they give you the vaccine. So uh, we're pretty well set at this point, I hope. That is fantastic news. Thank you guys for taking a moment to come off of mute and share new and good with us. This is, like I said, one of the practices that we have so that we can hopefully always be a positive and generative space. You can keep your new and good coming in the chat because it does make it more fun. And I am going to turn it over to Lila. And I'm going to share my screen. Is that right, Lila? Um, yeah, that would be great. I'll do that. You take over. OK, so thanks, everybody. Um, our Neighbor Up community of practice grew out of our work doing community network building. So we're gonna share some slides and kind of give a little history of how we came to the Neighbor Up community of practice. And we can go to the next slide, LJ. So, Community network building is really about assets, recognizing the assets and the talents that everybody brings. Um, we have this quote from Peter Block, um, who talks about transforming isolation and self-interest, right? Which is a lot of what um, the narrative is, the American narrative is, and transforming that into connectedness and caring for the whole. I don't know, LJ, did you have anything you wanted to share on that? Oh, you're muted. Yeah. Sorry, I kept muting myself. I guess <laughs> that uh, 
<laughs> um, the idea of showing up as your whole self in one of the one of the reasons that we start with new and good is so that folks can kind of settle into themselves and and remember that we get to be humans first instead of our role. Um, and so that's one of our practices that we have to, to get us in that role. So you know, I talked about this American culture, rugged individualism, historical, ongoing racism, deep inequality, public systems um, that maybe maintain um, uh, someone in power and powerless kind of mentality. Um, this is definitely something we see a lot in Cleveland. We are a very segregated city and uh, it ends up with isolation, maybe some invisible barriers that we don't often um, cross, communities that we are maybe historically taught not to go into. Um, and so that's kind of where we were sitting almost 10 years ago in Cleveland when we started to begin practicing this community network building. So um, community network building is all about connecting people to each other and making space for folks to step into public life in a way that feels fun and safe and really works in with our very busy lives, right? So long gone are the times when people can be all in on everything or anything. And so we really wanted to create a network where folks could pop in when they have space and are available and they could step out. Um, and so the focus is on creating this environment that connects people to each other and to opportunities and um, is really, really driven by relationships. And I guess I just wanna add that one of the reasons that we ended up needing a community of practice, someone said in the chat before that it's like the Jedi and the Padawan is because we were a bunch of Padawans trying to figure this out. We didn't know where our Jedi was. We had um, we had some, some Jedis, but they were not physically in Cleveland. So we needed a community of practice for sure. Lila, what do you wanna add here? I wanna add a little bit that when we started Cleveland Documenters, which we did our first training for documenters last fall, we really knew that our, the first documenters in Cleveland were gonna be really brave because they were stepping out and doing something in a city with a fairly closed government um, that hadn't been done before. And it's a small enough city that we knew that they were going to continually find themselves being the only members of the public in the room. Not that they wouldn't be welcomed, but we've had many occasions where they're asked to introduce themselves. And so we knew really that that community that you develop around that work is gonna be really important because it's gonna help people be able to have that support from each other to keep it fun and to make it feel safe. So the key tenets of community network building are that um, community network building is asset-based and relationship-driven. Um, it's very locally focused. So we're not always just focused on Cleveland, but even hyper-local hyper in very small parts of of Cleveland um, and it draws on network principles and structures. One of the things that I've been struck by as I've been hearing Lila talk about her work with documenters is that you all are naturally, I don't know if you've been trying to be a network, but you all naturally are building a network and it's really wonderful um, to see that. Anything else that you wanna add here? I would say the same thing. I think when we first found out about documenters, it felt like the joining together of two really um, interesting networks that were kind of developing in on parallel paths, but that that had a lot of commonalities. Yeah. I forgot we had this side, this this slide. So th this is these are our Jedi. <laughs> this is um, Bill Trainer and Frankie Blackburn. And so they were in two different states in, in um, Maryland and Massachusetts, and they were independently experimenting with how to do organizing different and then um, really together created community network building. And they helped to introduce us in Cleveland to community network building and have really um, been with us in different ways over the years. And there um, you can actually see some of their work at Trusted Space Partners. Um, and we have a, a, I don't think that she's here today. I see Tony, I see your face. So I think maybe we have other neighbor up members here, but um, Gwen often says the network is a space to grow in. And that's part of what makes it fun. 
So we're always um, trying to find new ways to do what we do and new ways to have fun and new ways to have connection. Because one of our core beliefs is if we're creating an event or a space, it should be something that we want, right? We should we should want to be in this space. And if we don't want to be there, if we feel like, oh, I got to go to work, then probably nobody else wants to be there either. <laughs> There's my favorite quote of Bill's. I mean, one of the things I love about this is that they didn't know each other. They were doing this independently and then met and then became kind of work and life partners after this. But one of my favorite Bill quotes is apathy doesn't exist. Yeah. So if you're, if you find yourself saying, oh, well, people would have come, but they, they, you know, they don't care. That's not the truth. It's all in your invitation. And do you want to be there? Have you created a space that you yourself would want to be in? Yeah. So we created this, um, so community network building is all about trying to starve that culture of fear, the dependency, the us versus them, the low expectations and a sense of fear of failure. Um, when I, we hopped on a planning call last, I guess it was just this week, earlier this week, Ellie said something about um, being a scrappy and experimental organization and I was in love instantly. Because <laughs> um, that is to me generative and aspirational. Where have you guys in your own lives, and you can share this out loud or in the chat, experienced this um, culture of fear? I can jump in LJ real quickly. I really experienced that. That was a huge part of my educational life as a young child, right? They're very much about following rules, making sure you got it just right. And I often find myself really fighting against that um, to this day. Yeah. Yeah. You get some agreement in the chat line. Yeah. Nilani. <laughs> Any other examples come to mind? Yes. Yeah, Susan. as a woman, Susan, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So at Neighbor Up, we um, we were trying to change that. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Lila. Yeah, I was going to just talk about trying to practice this culture of aspiration. And it starts with all these small practices. So we did new and good, and that just kind of primes us for positive and aspirational thinking before we go into a community of practice where we may find ourselves, or another gathering, where we may find ourselves having to have hard conversations. And so this, this network space becomes a place in which you practice those small um, practices that become habits, where you practice being able to give, so recognizing your own talents and what you have to offer, and you also practice being able to receive, so asking for what you need recognizing what you may be, what you may need and becoming comfortable asking for it. Um, and all these other things, entrepreneurial spirit, action-oriented, experimenting, relationship building. And so then the question around this slide is, where have you noticed this in the documenters network or in the documenters work? Well, an experience I had, this is Scott. Um, it's kind of interesting. I'd been asking, where does all the documenters content go for a year and a half? And I think they were getting tired of that question. So when Nalani uh, showed up, they, they kind of handed this off to her, I guess. And she very elegantly and smoothly handed it off to me before I even knew you know, what was happening. So we were talking about it what do we do about this? And like I said, before I knew it, I was in charge of figuring this out, um, which is fine, you know, and it worked out pretty well. Uh, we got some good information, but, um, you know, that, that was a, a very uh, direct experience, I think, of how you can be drawn into a community and do, do some positive things. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see that in the, the few months we've been doing this on the Documenters Message Board. And that, I didn't know it was you who was hosting that conversation, but led us to have a conversation in Cleveland where we were thinking, well, what do we do with all of this? But in this very small group of people. 
And then we saw that conversation and said, oh, well, clearly you would open this up to the entire network. And you would ask the people who have the knowledge and the talent who are doing this on a day in and day out. Where do they I think, think what, it should be yeah, shared? I th that's good to hear. I think one of the things that was interesting to me is, that, and I don't know if anybody else does this or not, but I came in saying, oh, this isn't my organization. I'm just asking this question. <laughs> you guys go do something with it, right? <laughs> well, no, that's not the way it works. So that that was a good, yeah. good lesson for me. It was very, it was it was a good experience, to say the least. Yeah. Yep. Someone who's outside the whole dynamic, like I don't know any of the details of what you're talking about, but what I'm oh. see, I'm hearing <laughs> you say, Scott, a little bit is that you were confronted with the opportunity to 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 be useful and you were com confronted with the opportunity to participate in community. Yeah, and I wasn't all that interested in doing that. You know? <laughs> but yeah, so, you did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, the project just briefly was there's like 50,000 oh, entries oh, by now, documenters content wow. in Chicago and it just sits there no longer. It doesn't sit there any, anymore. Huge amounts of information and what you know, what good was it? Well, you know, I think it's starting to get out in, in different ways. No, and not, not because of this project in particular. It was just, yeah. that's how I got interested in it. Yeah. Someone in the chat, Lila, said that, um, Olivia said, they're thinking immediately about how Documenter's message board has a give get section. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah. Um, you know, the other thing I just wanted to add here is this idea, again, about being able to participate as little or as much as you like. I mean, I think with this example Scott just gave, he was pulled into maybe more participation that he intended to. But that doesn't mean then that now he is in charge of all content. It doesn't mean that then he, he has to take on kind of this title or this role. It's something where he can take it on for right now share where he's interested in and then then pull back to the role that he needs to so it, it becomes very flexible this work so it does it doesn't work like um who used to say lj it's not your grandma's block club right if this is not <laughs> you know where there needs to be a president and a vice president and right. all these different roles right and one of the um kind of guiding principles of the structure is to not create form unless you need it so form yes but, yeah. um Sounds like you. Sounds hey. like the. This is uh, Terry from the Chicago Public Hi, Library. Terry. Um, Hi, Terry. <clears throat> um, you you want to have um, structure, but at the same time, you want um, you want to be fluid. Yes. Flexible, and people tend to flourish and to be more expressive if they're in the fluid situation. That's welcome. Yes. Absolutely. Very we'll nice. get, when we get a little bit later in the slides, we'll talk a little bit about the structure that is there because it is important that there'll be some structure in place and how that helps people easily engage. Thank you, Terry. You said Terry, right? Yes. Excellent. Thanks, Terry. <laughs> So we use this formula a lot at Neighbor Up, which is, and I, quite frankly, I use it I, in my life, I was I was just journaling about it this morning. So um, stories plus habits equal culture. And so when we're talking about changing and creating an, a culture of aspiration, we need to think about the stories that we're telling and the habits. So both the stories that we that we tell ourselves in our minds about ourselves and other people, and the stories that we say out loud, and the habits that we have um, both individually and as a group and um, and in society, and that if we focus on those stories and those habits, we can change culture. Um, so we're aiming to create this aspirational culture at Neighbor Up using what we call fresh practices. Lila, anything you wanted to add before we move on or? I would say that, you know, this idea of these habits, this is, becomes one of the I think one of the most engaging parts of community network building, because you're able to constantly be practicing these things. Um, and, and you know, as you're constantly practicing these small ways of behaving with other people, that it is part of this larger idea of recreating the culture in the community to make it a more engaging and connected one. 
So I think that's the only piece I would say is that these practices that we kind of use um, are really easy ways. And if you do them again and again, you're working towards this larger thing. And I think for me, if somebody says, we're gonna change culture, it immediately sounds way too big. Wait, I don't even know what that means, a little nebulous. But if we're gonna practice these practices and they become habits, then it, it gives me a roadmap and helps me understand where we're going. I totally agree with that, Lila. So I grew up in a 12 step program and I can remember when I saw this um, stories plus habits, this formula, I remember thinking, oh, they're talking about like a 12 step program. You gotta, you gotta change your habits. You gotta talk the talk. You gotta change who you hang out with. And I just, it instantly clicked for me. And actually it was a long time before I realized that community pra of practice, that, that a 12 step program was actually a community of practice. So um, it all comes full circle. So Lila mentioned practice. The way that you build a habit is by practicing, right? By, by practicing and failing um, and continuing to practice. So we call them fresh practices, um, mostly because they were new to us when we <laughs> discovered them and it stuck. Um, and so there's all of these little practices that we use um, and the ones that we have, we just made them up. Sometimes yeah. we borrow them from other places. They're not like the end all and be all of practices, I'm absolutely certain that there are people on this call who could teach us some practices. Yes. That would help us have an aspirational culture. Um, but the basic idea is that the environments that we create, you see this picture here of a circle, physically sitting in a circle, who here misses doing that? I could cry just thinking about missing my circles. Um, sitting in a circle reminds us that we are not a top-down triangular hierarchical organization. And when we act like a triangle and we're sitting in a circle, it's really obvious. <laughs> I say that as someone who's often the idiot who's acting like she's in a hierarchy <laughs> and needs to be brought back into the circle. <laughs> um, go ahead, Lila. I'm just going to say that I think this picture is our neighbor up community of practice pre pandemic. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, and so we have activities and protocols that we use. Um, and also, you're going to experience a couple more, or at least one more today. But also like the, the idea of physical space is really important. So you guys clearly get this. You um, even in a Zoom, right? You, you came in today. I was going to say you walked in today. There was music playing. Um, there was a link that said, welcome. There was an invitation to put your name in there. All of those small little details um, change how people operate. Um, they give us cues that this is a space that's meant to be different. One only other thing I would add here is that when the pandemic started, our community, neighbor up community of practice, which had been a monthly event in person, switched and it became a weekly online event. Um, the heroic efforts of Tony Vento, who's who, who is, is, is here today. <laughs> someone who's been hosting a weekly community of practice during a pandemic. Um, just the idea that, again, that flexibility, right? It doesn't have to be just so. It can adjust as needed. And I think um, what Tony would probably say is that this kind of, that way of being able to engage with people we found has been really, really important as people have been isolated at home. Yeah. So, um, Next. so how we started this shift to um, having a community of practice, I mentioned before that we were a bunch of, of Padawan trying to fill, figure this out. We were always talking about how we were building a plane and flying it at the same time. And it was this really invigorating, ever-changing environment where we went from, and Neighborhood Connections had been around for almost a decade, but they had been an organization of just three people. And now we were um, a staff of, was it six or seven people? And we were growing a network that was very quickly thousands of people. And so it was just this amazing invigorating time. And 
Um, if you were someone who was um, maybe not so excited by change, it was a frightening time. <laughs> Right. And so we started community of practice before we had what we now call community of practice. We had a team that was called Fresh Practices. And our job was to stay really, really, really focused on those minute habits. What are the stories we're telling and what are the habits? And we would have a conversation and we would say, OK, I did new and good three times last week. And on Tuesday, it was terrible. We're going to have a great conversation about that today. So we were as a staff kind of learning together and experiencing exactly really what India, what you described in your slides so beautifully. And then as the network grew and we were really trying to shift it from the staff who were trying to figure some things out um, into a network that was really owned by, stewarded by the community, we were doing the work of how can we really shift this to community ownership and community um, community stewardship with love and community of practice is the event space that really became key for that. I would add there that I, I think, and you or Tony correct me, I feel like in the beginning community of the pra community of practice was our place to do exactly what LJ said, practice these practices and kind of tear them apart and, and figure out when they weren't working. But I would say during the pandemic, it's become our most, our easiest entry spot. This is the place that we're hosting so regularly that whenever we talk to people, we say, oh, you should come join us at Community of Practice. So it's also shifted in its intent um, as time has gone along. And then when we started Documenters, we did our first training at, um, right before the election at the end of October, right before Halloween. We did our first documenters community of practice in December. Um, and again, we knew from the beginning that this a community of practice was gonna be really essential for the documenters community in Cleveland. Um, but I, I wanna stress here that, that the form follows function. You develop the space because you recognize the space is needed and that the space can adjust depending on if there's a pandemic or if you're starting a documenters program and you recognize, okay, this is what it's gonna feel like when people walk into this public meeting in Cleveland where no one has ever seen anything like this before. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about pipe. I love pipe. <laughs> LJ, LJ invented pipe. So one of the things, the pipe is a, 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 I guess it's a practice, a process that helps us determine when we want to create a new space. And it's a way to kind of go through the brainstorming process and say, okay, this is what this space could look like. This is something that the team of us who are stewarding documenters in Cleveland did before we went into hosting our first spaces. Um, and it, it starts with purpose, intention, process, environment. And if you're like me, I spent several years as a journalist um, years ago, you often go first to process. What are we gonna do? Let's get to the action. And it always helps me with pipe back up and say, what's the purpose of why we're doing this gathering? And what is our intention for how we want people to feel when they're in it? And that when you do that first, it's so easy to do it. And it immediately helps you be able to just then get to the process. Oh, okay, this is what we're gonna do. And this is what the environment needs to be like in order for our purpose to be fulfilled. So it's a nice little tool that we link to and that I, I, you know, you can definitely have links to afterwards that I think is helpful when you're thinking about creating a new space and when you're thinking about does this, is this space needed? Um, we then take what we pipe and we put it into a window pane, which looks like kind of a run of show for the gathering, but it keeps us focused on exactly what our purpose is in each piece of the evening. Lila, it really connects into as well, like, so you gave this example of how community of practice can shift and change when the circumstances change. It also can shift and change the biggest change I think has been the pandemic, but before that it shifted. So myself and Lee Kay, another steward of the network created our community of practice space. And then Tony who's here and um, L took it over or, and uh, not L, Erica Brown Erica. took it over and it really shifted and changed. 
but it stayed within the core because it was rooted in pipe. We had a very clear understanding of what the purpose was and the intention was, and the process can change a whole bunch, but because the purpose and intention are the same. And then I wanna circle us back. So in the chat, I think it was Terrence. Terrence, you asked about community ownership. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but the idea that you have a clear understanding and a clarity and agreement about the purpose and intention of a space and everyone has that same purpose and intention is, is, um, is one of the tools that we use so that the people can change. So you go back, if you anyone has ever gone to a 12-step meeting or even just seen one like on a TV show, a 12-step meeting is the same no matter where you go. There's little differences and stuff, but they're, they're created so that the structure is the same. You come in, you do this. You read these readings, you do this, and there's it's the structure is there. And it means that you don't need a hierarchy. And it also means that the people can shift and change and you still have it. And so those are all practices that we use for um, supporting community ownership. And then the idea, the bigger picture idea is that we're trying to create something, a network that um, although Neighborhood Connections is an organization and receives funding, and so they're a formal entity, we, we're trying as much as possible to create a network that is rooted in and has power that belongs not to one or two people or even 10 or 12 people, but is really um, in the power of the community. And so that's what I really mean when I say community ownership. I can't see you, Terrence, so I have no idea if I've answered your question. I can't see your face. I have no idea. Where are you? But if you need more, you put it in the chat. <laughs> When we go to the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about some of those pieces that Great. help exactly what you were talking about. Great. Right. Oh, he said, Terrence says, I asked that question because ownership of space often has been, has a negative connotation of ownership. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And so we're trying to shift that and, and break free of that, if you will. So um, are you ready for this slide, Lila? Yeah, sure. Um, so just, you know, with these, any network space, so community of practice, but other network spaces as well, we want to have some key components. So we want to be practicing the habit of sharing power. Um, we want to have multiple on-ramps and many levels of engagement. So then just under multiple on-ramps, um, something that's, I, I think has been fun to notice in Cleveland documenters in the past a month or so is that, you know, people have been able to come in for a few months covering documenting meetings. We tried our first special project and realized quickly um, where people could interview their friends and neighbors about the vaccine and realized quickly that was a new on-ramp, that we had new folks coming and saying, oh, you know, I, I'd always wanted to engage this way, but I was the, going to a meeting and documenting a meeting was too much for me or I wasn't interested in that. And then also another on-ramp is um, a community of practice. So specifically with our documenters work with our documenters community of practice, some people come in that way and um, they like to be there whether they've documented a meeting or not. Many levels of engagement, right? So you can come and you can show up and be quiet and, and observe. You can become an active participant or you may even wanna go deeper. Um, and there is a weekly, with the weekly community of practice that's been hosted during the pandemic, there's also a weekly space where you can come and practice being able to facilitate a portion of it. So once you wanna go a little bit deeper, you can come to that and then you can facilitate a piece of the evening. Um, yep, that's good. We can go to the next one. So we already touched a little bit on form follows function. Um, Lila talked, mentioned earlier block clubs. In Cleveland, we see block clubs often, not always, but often are sort of um, really quite frankly, old um, structures toxic. that are toxic and often used to as tools of using their they're racist they're being used to keep people out um, and um, we often see them really all focused on the form we need a secretary a president and it needs to be exactly this way but nothing else happens they just stay there and maintain the structure <laughs> 
And so one of the things that we talk about is have as little structure as necessary. Definitely structure is needed, but um, don't put in structure that's not needed because when you have structure, you have to maintain it. So if you have a committee, you have to you have to hold that committee together. Just having a committee is a lot of work. So, so have um, have less function. Have le less more function. Less, less form. <laughs> less form. <laughs> Testing for resonance. So, um, again, so we had we are a grass ultimately had historically been a grassroots grant making organization, and so we had thousands of groups that had been doing grants and sometimes in community projects in their neighborhood. And they would do the same thing for over and over and over again. And they'd be like, it's not working. We keep doing the same thing. It's not working. And so we would say this really revolutionary thing, which is stop doing it. <laughs> and, they're like, oh. and sometimes when you, you know, if nobody's showing up, you're, you're offering them the wrong thing. You have to stop offering them that to figure out and ask, what do you want? What is it that will get you excited to be, participate? Yeah. And then, I add a little bit, LJ on there. Yeah. Um, go, going back to the community of practice we host with documenters. Um, when we started it, we decided to start it in December. We started it as a test. Let's see if people want this. We think it works. We think it's you know a, a good, um, good form to promote the function that people may be looking for, but let's just test it. And so we're testing it a couple times. And it's also helpful because then as the stewards of the space, you don't have to feel like you have this heavy, scary thing you have to lift. You're, we're just gonna test it out, we're gonna try it. And after you test it for a couple times, you start realizing like, okay, it's fun. I like it, I feel comfortable. And then after you've tested a few times, and I think about three or four times, you get to a space where you, you say, okay, now, now I want to give it away. Now I need to be inviting other people to come in and start hosting this. Um, so I really love the idea of testing for residents because it, it helps it not be so serious. And you get to kind of test it out and practice and discuss with each other what's work and see if it makes sense for you to keep hosting it. Happy and experimental. Right, exactly. I'm seeing that we have, we're, we're gonna move it on. We're gonna keep going. A few we, minutes. Yeah, we have about four minutes left, three or four minutes. So um, here are um, the key roles. So we always talk about going back to that, like who's at the center of this network. Um, we have stewards of the network and you can be a steward like Tony who is hosting a weekly space, really our, our central space right now um, and for the past year, or you can be a steward who, um, maybe you're someone who is, right now we have some stewards who are helping to give out access codes to schedule vaccine appointments. And they might just give away five, they're still a steward in the network. So you can dip your toe in or you can be out. So um, as a steward of the network, this is the core work of a steward of the network, is to um, open the invitation. Always make sure you're inviting many, many people um, different types of people. People um, have enough invitation to know that there's really a chance to participate in, in the way that will fit for them. Your work is to build relationships and not just um, the ability to like click on something on social media and say that you know someone, but really to know people, to know them deeply. Um, to know the name of their cat. I don't know where Susan went, but I want to know the name of your cat and your kids, right? <laughs> um, to weave connections. So um, we are going to share a, an activity later and, and there are connections in this room. And so part of the work is to say like, oh, well, Lila needs this. And I heard that you have that and, and making sure that we're weaving those connections. Help us co-create these aspirational spaces. Um, maybe create new ones, and then also to spark and support action. Because even though we're working to change culture, we also are doing things. We are, you know, we're, we're doing real work that is changing systems. So um, anything else you want to add there, Lila? Um, no, just that the idea that this is leadership and that yeah. these core pieces help us um, act in the, in the way that we want to as leaders. Absolutely. And so um, this is what our community of practice looks like. Um, currently, 
Tony, as we said, Tony. So Tony, I was thinking too, Tony tested for residents to see if there was uh, appetite for having a weekly community of practice. And now it's been a year. <laughs> and there's still a really big appetite. <laughs> This, so again, you know, these are hosted on a regular basis. So the neighbor up community of practice has been weekly for the past year during the pandemic. The documenters community of practice is the fourth Thursday of every month. That structure allows people to know like, okay, this is, if I want to connect with this, I know when it's happening. I know what the Zoom link is. Um, I just had somebody who asked to come um, last month. And then it told me at the last minute, I can't, I have my stepkids. And I said, it's okay. It's the same Zoom link. It's the same time every month. Um, so that's, again, part of that structure that helps people to be able to tap into it when they can. We have the same type of, of format. So this is the format for documenters, community of practice. Tony, I don't know if the weekly community of practice is, is neighbor up community of practice is what we've based this on and, and worked from. But essentially, we want to have a setup time where that's open and welcome for the stewards to kind of come in, get settled, share their intentions for the gathering. We start with new and good, just like we started today. We start with a welcome. We do a fresh learning. We've really, really leaned in in the documenters work to the idea of fresh learning, which are similar to the web chats that India was talking about. And in fact, tomorrow we'll do um, something with someone from the city planning commission because people were asking questions about how that works. So just like a really casual kind of happy hour, fresh learning. But we always do a fresh learning in the documenters community of practice so that people can have a group conversation about something that they're learning about. New ways that people have handled it. We had a documenter come to fresh learning with a template she put together for live tweeting, which is excellent and then can be shared with other documenters as a way to prepare for the assignment and make it easier to step into the assignment. Um, and then we do business of the network. That's a long time neighbor up practice. It's 20 minute breakout conversations. Anyone in, in the um, gathering can host a conversation and those are um, generated in the moment. So this is, that's one of my favorite practices. I would definitely encourage people to check it out. We close and then we have this thing we call a parking lot hangout. So if we were able to be together, a lot of times after you go to an event, you walk outside in the parking lot and that's where you have some of your best conversations. So we've added parking lot hangout times to the end of our online gatherings just for people to hang out and talk, casual spots. So that's what a community of practice can look like. Again, it's the same structure time to time and that helps people be able to lean in to know what to expect, to feel comfortable. If someone comes in and says, well, I'd like to host new and good, excellent. You know exactly what it looks like. And there's a script. Um, we have public scripts that we share with folks that you can often find on our website. Um, and uh, that helps people be able to know to come into it and read straight from the script for their first time hosting it. We want to keep it formatted and, and we care and we want to take the time to pipe it and window paint it, but we don't want to make it so nice that people feel like there isn't a space for them to, to come into it. Hey, Lila, Tony's mo mentioning in the chat that this is uh, in a, a framework, not an agenda. Tony, do you want to say just a little bit yes. about that? It's so important. Yes. Uh, sure, I can get started. I, others can add to this. So. Um, most, first of all, these are gatherings. We like to think of them as gatherings, not meetings. Because I think as soon as we say meetings, we think, oh, there's an agenda that's been determined in advance, like what we're gonna talk about, in part because somebody already has an outcome they already want, and they just need butts in seats to, to, to conform, <laughs> essentially, um, is one version. An agenda um, reflects often a different form of power. Shared power is generated in this kind of outline or framework that invites people, as Lila and LJ gave so many examples, to bring themselves, who they are as a gift, including their hopes, challenges, questions, and that those are what determine the agenda, right? Like the way Lila explained business of the network. What's a question anybody here has? You can host one of those 20 minute breakout conversations and hear other people's experience, wisdom, gifts, connections, right? How different that is. 
So it's generative and open frame instead of top down predetermined. And it's putting into action all the talent in the room. You're, you're acting from the position of knowing that there's talent in the room and I have a challenge or a question and I know that the people in this room can help me think it through. Now, I wanted to add a quick something because I, I, this is uh, it's just something that I think is really important. When we talk about that format or structure that a lot of these things are timed. So business of the network is a 20 minute conversation. We're gonna uh, go through a marketplace in a little bit. These are very, you have a minute in the marketplace. The, the timing really helps people from getting on a soapbox. And it really helps, you know, we've had, we had a situation years ago where a console person came to a gathering and wanted to speak and people in the room immediately shut it down because that's not the, the format. That's not how this works. And if you've been coming even once or twice, you understand what, what this format is. So immediately the room says, oh, no, that's not what we do here. Um, I just want to really point that out because it, it really keeps from having people take over the space, which I think is a really common thing that you see happen. There was a lot of information in the, in the slide presentation. Uh, is that something that we could, um, that you could share with this group so we can sort of go back and reflect on it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I will, um, once we make sure we can answer everyone's questions, I'll do a little closeout for the evening. And uh, one of the things that I'll highlight is that in the agenda that we shared in the chat, there's a little takeaway section that has a bunch of resources and readings about communities of practice, if you're curious about learning more. And the first two items are both India and uh, the neighbor of cruise slide. So yeah, you can find that there. I'll also follow up with an email and um, that'll include the agenda as well. So. Uh, you'll have it in your inbox and it's in the chat now. Sounds good. I'm like loving this chat full of requests and offers. Yeah. Well, Chris is asking when is the next one of these events happening? Chris, that's a great question. Do you mean a public newsroom specifically or one of these, uh, like a community of practice for neighbor up? I guess I'll just go ahead and offer that the next public newsroom will happen at the end of April. Um, they are on a monthly basis. We haven't scheduled that yet, but um, you can keep an eye out on City Bureau's social media and sign up for our newsletter uh, to find that out. I'll also email you because you signed up for this newsroom. Uh, and then you can also find all of the neighbor up events uh, on the agenda as well. And I believe Lila um, or LJ perhaps dropped that link in the chat as well. Our next neighbor up community of practice is next Wednesday at one o'clock Eastern Standard Time. We also have an event called Arts and Culture Network Night that is less of a mutual learning space, but does use many of these practices. And that is on Thursday, um, April 22nd. And um, I we'll have to share the link later because I can't handle, I'm overloaded. It's also on the, the events link that I shared. On the events page. <laughs> It'll be there, it's there. I wanna say thank you. Thanks Ellie and India for inviting us here to do this. Um, it's always fun to reflect and, on uh, the work and to think about, it, it just helps you clarify and think about how, how we're doing it. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having us. Yeah, I will, I'll just go ahead and take that as our cue to transition for the evening. Uh, also, cause we've got about a minute left and I don't wanna keep anyone too late. I know we intersect with dinner time. Uh, so I'll just wrap up by saying thank you to all of you who participated tonight. My heart feels so full having shared space with so many folks that are new and uh, familiar to me, especially during this very isolated time. Um, I also wanna give a huge thanks to Lila and LJ for joining us, all the folks from the Cleveland network that are here. Um, I saw a lot of really beautiful comparisons and connections between Chicago and Cleveland in the chat, and it's really exciting to see that 
thinking happening. Um, also just like full transparency. I think like City Bureau as an organization like is learning so much from Neighbor Up and it's great to bring y'all into the space and really um, kind of model facilitation in real time. Um, so yeah, just a couple announcements and reminders on my end. Um, again, like I mentioned earlier, you can check out more resources and reading uh, under the takeaways uh, section of the agenda that we shared out in the chat. Um, also, speaking of events and next steps, uh, there is a documenters web chat happening next Tuesday at six. Uh, that is about freelancing. So if you are someone who is either a journalist who's freelancing or is interested in like jumping off the deep end with that or maybe dipping your toe into the pool. Um, we should have a really great panel of folks who are really making that work in Chicago, some of whom have come through um, City Bureau's programs in the past. So uh, feel free to check that out if you are curious about it. Um, I also have a request for this event, which is that if you have feedback about today's workshop, I'd love to hear it. Uh, it helps us be more responsive to your needs the next time we plan one. So uh, again, the link to that is in the public agenda and I can link to that um, as well in the chat. And I think that that is it for me, India, LJ, Lila, anything you guys would like to share before we close out? All right, beautiful. Thanks again, everyone. Have a really lovely Thursday night. Thank you for sharing the space.